Well, thank you all for coming today. I'm delighted to see so many people, although why is everybody in the back? <laughs> no? There's plenty of seats up front for all of you latecomers. Um, so we have a really ambitious agenda today. So we um, want to get going and move forward. But what we'd like to accomplish today, we'd like to um, accomplish these two goals. We'd like to identify uh, the opioid issues in our community, make sure we have some consensus and understanding about what exactly is going on in our community. Um, and then let's, we uh, want to turn this from a dialogue into an action planning process. We want to uh, begin the planning process to develop a community-based response and identify some evidence-based <coughs> interventions that may help us get a handle on the opioid opioid issue uh, in our community. So um, because there are um, so many of us here in the room today, um, we're not going to take the time to say who we are and who we represent, um, but we do have some very special guests in our audience today, and so we would like to uh, bring them forward and have them talk to us a little bit about uh, why this issue is of particular importance to them. So I would um, I'd like to invite up uh, Mayor John Southers uh, to come and uh, tell us a little bit about why he's here today. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for coming out today to engage in a discussion about a very important topic. Uh, we do have a opioid epidemic in Colorado, and you probably agree with that or you wouldn't be here. Uh, the dimensions of it are quite severe. Uh, I think our numbers have improved a little bit in the last couple of years since I was totally engaged in this. but. A couple of years ago, it appeared we had about a quarter of a million Coloradans addicted to prescription drugs, about 6% of our population. Think about that. Uh, we were, at that time, uh, number two per capita uh, prescription drug abuse in the country behind Oregon. I think we've dropped down a, a few places. Uh, there, this has been a, a, a matter of attention in Colorado for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, here's essentially the problem. Uh, we have a lot of people because of everything from over-prescribing to getting a hold of, uh, uh, you know, from prescription fraud to getting a hold of grandma's opioids, becoming addicted uh, to prescription opioids. When we have success in interrupting uh, their, their access to prescription opioids, uh, either through the prescription drug monitoring program, which has improved from about 15% participation to maybe close to 50% at this point in time, still a lot uh, of room for uh, improvement, or you know, we have other means of success in interrupting the flow of prescription uh, uh, opioids to someone. They are, in many cases, turning to street opioids. And as you know, we have uh, a, a heroin epidemic, and we have record numbers of uh, heroin overdoses and deaths. So this is a complicated uh, issue. I've come to the conclusion over the last couple of years that, uh, you know, understanding that once you've got someone addicted to prescription opioids and you uh, interrupt that supply, they may well turn to street opioids. The key to this whole thing is not getting them addicted to prescription opioids in the, in the first place. And I think that really has to be uh, uh, focus of a great deal of our attention. Uh, so I'm glad to have this conversation come to uh, Colorado Springs today, and hopefully we can, uh, you know, uh, come to some uh, consensus about uh, uh, a course of strategy to address it. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to invite Commissioner Sally Clark. Thank you. Well. Um, it's an honor for me to serve also as the president this year of National Association of Counties. And in that role, NACO, National Association of Counties, has a really a strong role and a strong voice at the national level with voices on this particular issue. Uh, one of those key issues is the opioid epidemic that is plaguing our communities, as Mayor Southers pointed out, and here in Colorado as well. Um, my NACO presidential initiative is Safe and Secure Counties, and that demonstrates why counties matter. We play a vital role as we look at keeping communities safe uh, from local government standpoint that moves by providing a safety net. We maintain our roads and bridges. We protect public safety. We support public health and human services. And importantly, we build resilient local economies. But each year, counties nationwide invest $93 billion in justice systems, law enforcement, and crime prevention. 
and we invest $83 billion in public health. We also invest billions in economic development efforts because strong economies are the building blocks of safe and secure counties. But to keep our community safe and secure, NACO is at the forefront of addressing the opioid epidemic that is facing us today. And earlier this month, National Association of Counties and National League of Cities announced a new joint task force that will be dealing with this issue. And in another week or so, I'll be heading actually to Washington, D.C. We have from uh, Melody Colbert Keene, who is uh, from Joplin, Missouri, is the current League of Cities president, and I'm president of NACO, and we have each jointly appointed task force members. And next month that that will take place um, in D.C., and we'll hold our inaugural meeting in Washington. City and county leaders across the country are looking to enhance awareness about this issue. We'll focus on how cities and counties can collaborate to really stop this epidemic. And we see locally the devastating effects of what it's doing with regard to prescription drug abuse and, as Mayor Southers pointed out, sort of the gateway into opioids and heroin abuse that we're seeing today. So this initiative that NACO and League of Cities has put together will help to mitigate the crisis and strengthen the safety and security of our neighborhoods. But partnerships like this are extremely important on a local level. Drug overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death in the US. More than 47,000 lethal drug overdoses happened in 2014. Let me say that again, 47,000 deaths from accidental death. That's more than traffic accidents. This epidemic is largely driven by those overdose deaths related to prescription pain relievers and to deaths related to heroin. There were 259 million opioid prescriptions written in 2012, which is more than enough to give a pill bottle to every American adult. Today, NACO is joining with President Obama at the National Prescription Drug Abuse and Heroin Summit, as was pointed out, in Atlanta, Georgia. And as part of today's event, the President is highlighting the public and private sector actions that will escalate the fight against prescription opioid drug abuse and heroin. This includes NACO's partnership with the National Governors Association, National League of Cities, United States Conference of Mayors, to expand access to medical-assisted opioid overdose treatments. Uh, some of you may have read the Color Springs Police Department has had several recent saves uh, from using the medication uh, Narcan, which is a nasal spray that is fairly new on the market. Um, naloxone has been used for many years by our first responders, but um, they have had some saves. And that's important because sometimes our police are all first on the scene. Fire has been using it, fire and EMS, for quite a few years, but it's an injectable. So this is new news for us. And through U.S. Communities uh, Purchasing Agreement, which has been made through our various local organizations, Narcan nasal spray is available at a 40% discount to local agencies. Dr. Turbush, who um, is on our Board of Health, said uh, recently that it's more potent and less expensive and 80% of the heroin users we're seeing today started out with misuse and abuse of prescription painkillers. And the death rate from prescription opioid overdose nearly quadrupled from 1999 to 2013. That heroin overdose rose 270% between 2010 and 2013. Those are astounding numbers for us. And so anything we can do here from local government standpoint to support that. Um, I'm also a Board of Health member. I'm also the liaison to uh, Department of Human Services Advisory Board. And this is something that we all care about as a community. So thank you for being here today and let us know how we can help. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in DC with uh, the drug czar, uh, Michael Botticelli, who works for the White House. And uh, this is one of the White House's top priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Um, I'm also pleased uh, we have a representative from the uh, 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 State Attorney's Office today. Mr. Jose Escobel is here. So good afternoon. Um, I'm one, probably one of the unfamiliar faces to you all, but 
Pleased to be here representing Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman. I am a director of a new office in the AG's office uh, called the Office of Community Engagement. And in that role, we oversee a variety of pieces of work, one of which actually, um, when Mayor Southers and I, uh, was the previous Attorney General, he and I had the opportunity to work, gosh, since 2006. I think we served probably almost nine or 10 years together on something called the, originally it was called the Meth Task Force, the Colorado Statewide Meth Task Force. That was repurposed into a group called the Substance Abuse Trend and Response Task Force. And I have had the honor to serve as Vice Chair of Prevention. So I'm here in that capacity. Uh, currently, uh, Attorney General Kaufman serves as the chair now. And uh, this group has been looking at this issue uh, of prescription drug abuse for quite a while now, which is one of the reasons we changed the name. And I have to say that under Attorney General and uh, Mr. Sutherland's Attorney General, we paid quite a bit of attention to the prescription drug abuse issue. Uh, and in fact, uh, under his watch, uh, almost $2 million went to funding some public awareness work that we were doing at the state level. So what I'm here to share with you is a couple things about what's going on, that as you begin to do your planning, to share with you uh, the sense that there are some things happening at the statewide level that we're here to be supportive. Uh, I can tell you that you're probably the only, you're one of the first communities that I know of that's beginning to have this serious conversation as a collaborative group. I know other communities are doing parts and pieces of this kind of work to respond, but this is the first community that I'm aware of that's really coming together to think through comprehensively what can we do to make an impact on this issue. We've watched it grow, uh, even from the state level as we're watching the data. We had this on our radar screen. And so you should know that there is a prescription drug abuse task force group. It's called the consortium. And I'm gonna pass out um, a little bit of a diagram of this group because this group has been in place for a number of years. And it really is a group that I think as you do your work, you can get connected to. So let me give you a sense of what this group is doing because it serves as the committee, the prescription drug abuse committee for the task force that I'm talking about. This group is, um, uh, has a coordinating body, a backbone group out of the School of Pharmacy uh, with the Colorado University, uh, CU University Boulder. They're uh, outstationed out of Anschutz campus in Aurora. But let me give you a sense of how comprehensive this work needs to be as you think about where you're headed and where you're going. Number one is gonna be data, right? You gotta know what's going on. Who's being affected? How's it being affected? Where in the parts of the geography of your, your, your town uh, are people really uh, seeing troubles here? And that goes from everything from who's prescribing to who's using, to who's being affected in terms of their health or even their death. We do have a data research work group, so if for some reason you need data from the state, we have a way to help get you some data locally. More importantly, we're working on a data mapping process that you might want to put some of this information into a web-based uh, database system to kind of map all these different issues. Where are these things occurring? We can coordinate with you to get access to this web-based mapping software program so that you can get some of that data together and make some decisions and plans around that. Public awareness. We have a campaign called Take Meds Seriously. This is the campaign that was funded under Attorney General Southers, uh, where we have ready-made material for you all. You don't have to start from scratch. You can brand it with your own brand, come up with the name of your, your uh, uh, initiative, and you can take these materials and brand that public awareness. It's there, it's all public uh, uh, domain material ready to be used. Safe disposal, how many of you have participated in safe disposal efforts in your town? Several of you have. You have law enforcement folks that are helping set up these sites. We have one coming up at the end of April where we want to encourage folks to get rid of these things. Astounding amount of prescription drugs. Mr. Southers has been to some of these events just watching people bring in bags and bags of material. It's not going away. But now the next trick is to get permanent drop-off sites, is to begin working with your pharmacies, working with your police forces, working with others on the drop-off and then the disposal and collection and disposal. So getting those things permanently set up, because folks, it's a really crazy system where we have all these prescribed drugs, uh, narcotics going out the door, ending up in homes, and then where do they go from there? And as uh, uh, Mr. Southers was saying, when you prescribe someone for some uh, uh, painkillers for whatever reason, is there a reason to give them 30 pills when they can maybe use four? And maybe they use the four, what happens to the other 26? And then if you're working with realtors, I hope you have realtors represented somewhere, but folks, if they're not locking up, if people aren't locking up their meds, we've got people shopping through the realtor market, walking into homes to just observe, and then looking into cabinets and taking what they can. So there's a whole bunch of things that can be done around disposal. 
the Narcan uh, work right now, Attorney General Kaufman, we are looking at getting some funding to do mass increase of access of Narcan to first responders and law enforcement, particularly in the southern part of the state. So we're right now working with multiple partners to do a large purchase in bulk and get that out into law enforcement hands because this is a drug that can save lives. If you don't know about it, uh, please we want you to get informed about how this drug can work and make sure that there's access to this in your pharmacies. There are standing orders at the state level that will allow uh, friends, family, whoever, to purchase uh, naloxone, but you gotta make sure that the pharmacies are carrying it. So that may be another group to be considering what you need to do. We have a provider education work group, so if you want to work with your providers, we're talking dentists, anyone that prescribes, dentists, medical, whoever prescribes, we've got some modules for training. Work with your local medical folks, we can help you provide that training, you just need to be able to be the champions to make sure that they're uh, getting that education. And then the prescription drug monitoring program, although there is a mandate that prescribers must uh, register for this monitoring program, there is not a mandate to use it. So any strategies you can come up with to really encourage those um, uh, medical sites to actually consult this, because what you've got are people who are shopping doctor, doctor to doctor, who are looking for these medications or someone who's gonna prescribe to them. Or you may have an unscrupulous or unscrupulous person, uh, a, a physician or someone who's that pill mill type of uh, physician. You wanna be able to monitor that. And then the last one we have is the treatment work group. And having you take a look at what are the options for treatment. And what was mentioned earlier here uh, by Commissioner Clark was the um, use of Medicaid assisted treatment. Uh, very, very beneficial for folks, but you have to make sure that your treatment providers are trained and can actually offer this form of treatment for people who are addicted to opioids. So I'm gonna pass out uh, that information for you, give you a sense of the comprehensive nature. What I really wanna let you know is that you're not alone in this that part of the work of the task force that uh, I'm part of is to assist local communities. So I'm here today to listen, to learn, and then to coordinate with you all that if there's something you need from the state level, let us know, we'll figure out what we can do. I've got a network of 28 members of a task force that if there are existing resources, we'll connect you to the existing resources. If there are issues that you come up with that require some sort of policy response, then we have a task force that can write, uh, write up recommendations to the state legislature and be advocates for you in terms of what you need in regards to policy. Policy. So I'm looking forward to learning and following along as you move on your uh, uh, path here. And I'll leave you one last thing. How many of you are familiar with um, the uh, uh, principles of collective impact? How many of you have even heard that phrase? So a few of you have. Okay. For those of you in the room that are familiar with collective impact, um, educate the rest of your peers because that's the type of approach that you're going to really need is this group of folks coming together, reinforcing each other towards a common goal. And you can learn a lot from those principles of collective impact. So Mary Thank you for the invitation, and I'm pleased to have been here today. Thank you so much, Mayor Southers. Thank you, Commissioner Clark, and thank you, Mr. Escobar. It's great to know that that uh, you know this conversation is important at both our city level, at our county level, at our state level, and at our national level, and that we're not alone, and that maybe perhaps we're one of the first communities convening this conversation. Candidly, we're used to being trendsetters here, and we are the home of collective impact because we're the home of Community Health Partnership, um, who is the group that brought us here together today. So I do want to give um, a special call out to Mary Steiner, to Laura Thomas, to Carol Bruce Fritz, to all the folks from Community Health Partnership that helped arrange this, that brought us all together, that recognize that it's time to have a community dialogue and time to move forward together to address this important issue. I'd also like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Joel Dickerman uh, to come and walk us through some data points to help uh, frame our conversation. Great. Thank you. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot of statistics, so I'm not going to linger on each individual point, but I think the, the things that we really want to emphasize right now as we get into a discussion mode are several factors. One, this isn't just a national program a problem, it's a local problem. So I, again, these statistics and, and our previous speakers have said this is it's very much at home in the state of Colorado in our community. I think the second thing that I've noticed is I think there's a, there's a feeling that maybe this is a problem of the poor. This is very much a problem across all spectrums, including the affluent. And I think you can't read a, a tabloid or a news article that doesn't talk about a very wealthy actor or sports athlete having an addiction problem. These drugs are very, very addicting. And most of the time, they occur from a just routine use for pain management and then that goes on into an addictive type of behavior. I care for a lot of elderly people. I've seen elderly people unintentionally become quote unquote hooked, physiologically hooked on an opioid in as soon as seven to 10 days. 
So you can see somebody undergoing a hip replacement, um, a minor surgical procedure, taking their medicines as prescribed for a short period of time, and then physically when they stop that medication, go through a physical withdrawal. So it, these, these medicines are very, very potent. The, da the other side is they're very effective. I think some of the challenges that we're gonna talk about, um, in addition to, I say that these problems occur, one, it's a problem of convenience. We see a lot of young um, individuals take these medicines because they're convenient. Um, mother, father, grandparent may, be, may have the medicines in their uh, medication cabinet and it's easy for a, an adolescent or an, a teenager to get to these medicines. And unfortunately a popular thing now is pill parties. And we see these um, increasingly where a, a, you know, somebody will invite their friends over and get their friends introduced to this type of a substance. Um, the other issue though I think we're going to really have to address is, and I think some of you in the audience are representing this is, although we're talking about an opioid problem and an epidemic and deaths related to it, as a provider, we also have to address adequate pain relief. And I think this is the big challenge as a medical provider. I do a lot of hospice care. And the challenge I have is being able to give adequate pain relief and adequate relief of suffering, but not causing a problem. And to me as a physician, prescribing opioids is the one of the most difficult things to do. I have to be a patient advocate on one time, and I have to police activity on the other hand. Then the other area that we really have to address as we see these issues of addiction arise is that we really do have to look at it as a medical problem. We're gonna have to offer addictive addiction services. Like I say, a lot of these individuals become addicted unintentionally, and it is extremely difficult to overcome this addiction. There's a physiological response. Uh, you'll go into a withdrawal, you get uh, very agitated, you have a lot of problems with anxiety, and so stopping the medicine isn't as simple as saying, I'm not gonna do it anymore. You have to go through some kind of a uh, addiction type of management. So that's, we wanna frame this discussion, like I said, I don't wanna go through the statistics other than say that it is a local and a comprehensive problem, but really where we wanna go today with the discussion is how do we address this issue locally? How do we do it in a meaningful manner that allows for adequate management of people, pain and symptoms, and for those people that do have a substance abuse issue, we get them adequate treatment. One of the things that, the other thing that this reminds me and it's interesting is the other issue that I deal with with the senior population is um, I think a lot of people feel that opioid addiction is a problem of the young. It becomes a problem of the old and there's two reasons. One, a lot of elderly people put on narcotics for chronic pain conditions. The other thing that we run into is that many 70 and 80 year olds are the children of the 60s and the drug uh, uh, culture. In fact, I have patients surprisingly in their 70s and 80s that when we do a baseline drug screen before we start opioids are positive for cocaine and marijuana and a bunch of illegal drugs because it's the culture they grew up in. So that's the fourth issue we're gonna really have to deal with. What is the culture as far as um, prescriptions and drug abuse, not just for the young, but for our elderly patients as well. <laughs> 